Well, I don't want to say bless. We have, we have a wonderful. <laughs> Oh, by the way, I'm going to tell you something. Everybody's asking me, what, is, what do I have on? I, I have a website in which I design all these kind of shirts, the atheist stuff. And this one happens to say, what? The born again, or uh, righteous when, the born again righteous were uh, robbed of their, what is it? Read that. When their rapture was ruptured. Okay? And you know what we're talking about. So they're out there. They were out there uh, a couple of days before that uh, May 21st date. And it is because of that you had like a church that had about 30 members with knapsacks on their back and poles sticking up and between them was a banner that said the days are coming to an end, et cetera, et cetera. You better get and pray now and, and, and uh, get rid of your sins, et cetera, et cetera. I don't see any of them now. That's because they drank the Kool-Aid. Yeah, they drank the Kool-Aid maybe, but they're not there. But they may come out again come this October. According to them, the rapture was supposed to start on the 21st of May, and it was, Jesus Christ was supposed to come down, pick up the dead, and halfway up into heaven, he was going to find out who was uh, good and who didn't sin, and drop off the rest, to turn into dust, and never come back again. And, uh, and then there were going to be all kind of earthquakes, big, giant ones all across the world, and it's supposed to be the end of the world come October 21st. It looks like our, uh, Harold Canvas Chambers is still saying the same thing that October 21st is the date. This I'd time love to see him on the 22nd. This time he's not kidding. This time, he's not kidding. <laughs> this time he's not kidding. Okay, our guest speaker is Ayana, and that's the way it's not pronounced, not Ayana, but Ayana. Ayana Watson, founder of Black Atheists of America. If you remember, three months ago I came here and I told you some of the difficulties that I've had and the challenges, which I think is a better word to use, when dealing with my own kind, as far as blacks are concerned, and how they are involved in the black community with the church and whatnot, and that had made it difficult and how I had to work through that. Today, you're going to go one step further from that into seeing a you need to help or two, and I'm going to ask you during our Q&A that it turned into a Q-A-N-S for some suggestions. Please, please, please do not give us a... a an hours long uh, lecture about how things started with the communists and how things changed. We don't need that. We just need for you to give short, quick questions and some suggestions. We're open to that. Thank you very much for that. On facing the opposition to the new atheist group in the black community, how and why we must do it. A talk by Anna Watson, founder of the Black Atheist in America Incorporated. We welcome the new atheist group, Black Atheists of America, that come meet its dynamic young leader. She's very important. She has some good ideas and we're all, as I said, she's still open to suggestions. Now, can you do this? Let's start a new atheist group from scratch. Oh, it takes chutzpah, right? Chutzpah. Say it again. Chutzpah. Okay. Chutzpah, right? Well, it says chutzpah, and sometimes a little chutzpah on the slide. Anyway, brains, talent, and conviction. Now, come and meet our young woman here, who evidently possessing all of these traits, chutzpah, etc. How's that? She has, started a new, she has started a new atheist group called Black Atheists of America. B-A-A -A with a small M. If you, if you Google Black Atheist on your computer, her site is now the number one spot be, be, uh, being accessed on in the internet in that particular category. The perky founder of Young A Black Atheists uh, is Ayanna Watson of New York City. Ayanna Watson now lives in New York City. She was born and raised on Long Island in New York. And Ayanna was brought up by a deist father and a Baptist mother. <laughs> she attended Lutheran Church Base High School, and Ayana attended Brooklyn College. Ayana has also earned an MBA and a JD, Doctor of Jurisprudence, from Duke. I'm sorry, from uh, Drake University. She also has been in, in, interviewed by the Freedom from Religious Foundation (FFRF). The blacks have established themselves at, in the atheist world from the following leaders. W.E.B. Du Bois, Alton Lemon, by the way, Alton Lemon is a, is a person who uh, was the arguing case for the three-pronged uh, test helping the Supreme Court in determining the validity of any religious-based laws. Ernest Chambers, another black, challenged against the legislation on prayer 
And Ishmael Jeffrey won a legal suit in Alabama Supreme Court against uh, mediating prayer before the start of a particular session or any sessions. Now she has two major goals, maybe more later on, but two major goals which are important right now. And those goals are following. One, focus on bringing the diversification in problem solving ways that other than prayer to solve issues facing the black community. And two, focus on the youth from an early age to enhance their critical thinking skills. Both are very important in order to get your foot in the door and be able to work with them. Ayana is an intelligent, creative, brave voice for building a just secular society. She is also wickedly wonderful, irreverent, good humored, and charming. <laughs> Before I welcome, I just want to mention this that she's a great person, that she's a great listener, and she'll also make a great counselor if you need a lawyer. She has <laughs> she has passed, by the way, her New York State bar exam. So I'd like for all of you to give a big hand and I want to turn you over to him. Please. Welcome Ayana. Is it on? Yeah. Oh. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I got two intros today. I uh, wasn't expecting that. How is everybody doing today? Good. 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 Awesome. Um, I want to thank Ken uh, Bronstein, who's not here today, but for having me uh, speak here today. Um, also, I want to thank my directors, uh, Jermaine Inouye, who is responsible for all our media on our uh, on our uh, social sites. Uh, Mark D. Hatcher, who is a PhD candidate at Howard University. Jamila Bay, who is a comedian and journalist. And my father, who is the CFO of the company. Um, <clears throat> and obviously, I want to thank everybody here for coming to hear me speak at the New York City Atheist uh, Sunday Brunch. So um, you've already heard a little bit about um, my personal background. I'm going to speak about my personal experiences with religion and also transition into why I started Black Atheists of America, where we are now, and uh, how you can participate. So I grew up my, uh, with a deist father and a Baptist mother. Um, religion was never really an issue in the house. Um, we didn't talk about the Bible or anything like that. Uh, so it was a pretty cool growing up. That, you know, I just went to uh, school and played with my friends. At about nine years old, my parents thought it would be a good idea for some reason to send me to a, uh, a faith-based summer camp. And for me, at nine, I'm like, this is freaking awesome because you know I was going to be away with all of my friends. Uh, but that quickly changed. When I got there, um, <laughs> from orientation to the day I left, I was lost. All of my friends had been uh, active members of their churches, uh, of their respective churches, and uh, they had already heard these, you know, wonderful, or not wonderful, but these stories in the Bible. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? Like, I, you know, I came here to play. I didn't come here to <laughs> read all of this. So um, I'm at the, the, this place, and I'm feeling, uh, I guess, a little bit down, because I, did, I couldn't go to my friends. I mean, at nine years old, your friends are notorious for making fun of you, so I didn't want to be the stupid kid. And um, I wanted to really understand. I didn't want to be, uh, you know, the, 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 the outcast. So I spent a lot of my free time, which I should have been playing with uh, friends, talking to the religious leaders at the camp, trying to understand what it was uh, that I was not understanding. And I mean, at nine, these people are adults, and of course, they're supposed to be smarter than me. So that's what I did. Um, so we had this, uh, this book, uh, and every day your religious leader was supposed to sign off on this book. Uh, in third grade, uh, I'm sorry, they were so, supposed to sign off once you um, completed the assignments for the day. So in third grade, I had just learned uh, how to write in script. So I decided, you know, since I was falling behind, I was going to uh, write, uh, you know, my, my le religious leader's name. And of course, I got reprimanded for that because uh, they figured out, you know, a third grader, I mean, sorry, yeah, a third grader wrote it and not uh, the religious leaders. So. Uh, I, but, you know, I still struggled with this idea uh, or with these ideologies because although my parents didn't indoctrinate me with religion, 
uh, they did a great job in establishing critical thinking skills. And so when I'm at camp and I'm like, hey, I don't understand this, uh, this idea of, well, just believe and you have to open your heart. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I have that. But you know, if I'm praying and my friend over here is praying at the same time, um, how does God hear both of us? And I wanted like an, an actual answer to this, um, maybe a process or something. Because I'm like, you know, if I'm praying, I want to make sure like the big dude upstairs hears my prayer. You know, how do I how do I know it doesn't get mumbled or whatever? And <laughs> so that's uh, th those are some of the, the questions that I had. And as ridiculous as it may have sounded, you know, I guess to them back then, I understand it's actually a Pretty good question, in my opinion. But uh, yeah, those are some of the things that I had uh, issues with. <clears throat> so um, needless to say, I did graduate as a Christian. I got my certificate at the end. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that was, uh, that was summer camp for me. Uh, after that, I go to, um, I start attending church regularly with my friends in Sunday school, and I'm becoming more and more familiar with the Bible. And it, uh, it was okay, except for I still never felt right in church. It never felt like a place that was for me. And um, that was just my, I, I gave a lot, I, I still didn't understand anything. I gave a lot of lip service so, to things that I was supposed to say. So God bless, or open your heart to God, or I have faith. Like I, I just reiterated anything somebody said to me, and it was good enough to keep somebody quiet because they wouldn't say anything after that. I was like, you know, this is great. So uh, that was my experience with uh, religion up until high school. High school, I go to a Lutheran Bay school, and it actually uh, is a, a really good school. Um, and we had to take religion class every semester. The teacher that I, I'm, I'm sorry, every year, the teacher that I had um, at my school. Uh, used to make us, it was kind of like a um, non-structured class. So you would come in the class, you would pick up a Bible, you would um, pick a, a verse of your choice, and then you would uh, write a paragraph or two of what it meant to be, what, it, what that um, verse meant to you. And so one day, you know, I'm flipping through the Bible, doing my thing, and uh, I get to Leviticus 20.13, which says not only is homosexuality uh, an abomination, but it's also punishable by death. Now, if you're going to school in New York, uh, I find it very hard to believe that you won't have at least met a homosexual. So I had a couple of homosexual friends, and I also have some homosexual family members who were good servants to whatever person they praised. Like, everybody that I knew was religious, or at least said they were. Um, and I knew that my all-loving God wouldn't um, want to punish them for something that I knew that they had no control over. Even back then, I understood that homosexuality was not a choice, uh, that they were as, you know, that they were simply um, attracted to somebody of the same sex. So I, at that point, I'm like, okay, I understand the Bible is inspired by God, but it was written by man and they looked like they got it wrong. So I dismissed the Bible um, at that point. Around the very same time, um, during high school, we were, one of my teachers uh, stated that Emily Dickerson didn't believe that you had to have, um, that you didn't have to go to church to have a relationship with God which was freaking awesome because I still hated church at this point. And I'm like, you know, I always felt like, you know, in the black church, it's very lively and it's very, um, you know, you're clapping your hands. It lasts all freaking Sunday. I'm like, I don't want to be here. I want to go home. I want to, I wanted to watch football. That was the thing that my father and I had uh, together. Um, and I couldn't do any of this because I had to spend three to four hours in freaking church. So I'm like, you know, if, if it's good enough for Emily Dickerson, it's good enough for me. Another issue that I had with the church was um, the whole cannibalism thing. Um, I was cool with God, I mean, with, with Jesus dying on the cross and all, but I didn't want to eat him. Like, I used to skip communion, which was the last Sunday of every month, because I just felt like I, I can't, the, the representation of cannibalism was a bad thing. Uh, I just, I, I'm like, you know what, I'm cool with God, I can't do that. So 
I just used to skip church, and then obviously I didn't. I stopped going to church because Emily Dickerson uh, said I didn't have to. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, um, I left high school. I was uh, I classified myself in perhaps incorrectly, I, th I still think it's arguable, um, as a deist because I had dismissed, you know, the, r the rituals of religion, most of them. I had dismissed the Bible, and the only thing I had left was prayer, but I wasn't the type of person to sit down and pray before a meal or before I go to bed or something like that. It would be like, okay, this is a really big issue. I can't handle it. Maybe I need some help from God. So only during these major crisis, if you want to even call it. I mean, it probably wasn't anything major, but <laughs> in high school, everything seems major. So only during those times did I actually ever um, <clears throat> do the whole prayer thing. So th th that, was, that was that. College, I'm still a deist until um, my third year at uh, Brooklyn College. I don't know what card I'm on anymore. Sorry, I want to make sure I don't go off on a tangent. <laughs> so third year, uh, I'm required to take uh, Philosophy 101, which I'm like, oh, you know, this is bullshit because it, I didn't see how it was related to my business degree. But I went ahead and took it because I, I had to do it for uh, Brooklyn College. It was a requirement, right? It was a core course. And so um, I'm very grateful for having to take that course because Philosophy 101, like, completely changed my entire way of thinking. I went from a 2.5 to a 3.8 in one semester and ended up graduating on top of my class. It was amazing. <laughs> um, so during this class, you know, we're told what claims are, what sufficient evidence is. And because I had struggled with religion, and I think I was very lucky for this, um, because I had struggled with religion, nothing was left off the table. And I really um, evaluated my entire belief system. And everything started to make sense. I mean, I no longer had to question, why is it OK that you know, I can sit here and pray uh, that I get my scholarship, and I turn on the freaking TV and see a kid with flies flying in his eye, and I'm like, damn, you know, God, you can't help this kid over here, but you can help me get you know, my scholarship straight or you can help me buy my new car, but you can't help this mother who's malnourished and can't uh, produce enough breast milk to feed her newborn. I, it made sense when you no longer had to sit here and be like, there was a guy upstairs that was neglecting the poorest of the poor and willing to help the, the most affluent members of society. And so um, I really appreciated uh, that course um, for that. It took about, three weeks for me to become an atheist in this class. Um, I didn't know I was an atheist. I still believe atheist was synonymous with the word evil or devil worshiping, so I wasn't either of those. Um, but I did do some research online, and I realized that I was, in fact, an atheist. Um, and so I, I didn't tell anybody. Uh, I waited till the end of the semester and I decided, you know what, I, you know, it's kind of eating me up. I want to tell somebody and I decided to tell my father um, because it, it kind of came down to my father or my mother and my mother had become increasingly more religious over the years and my father just seemed to be more accepting of people with different belief systems. So I'm like, okay, uh, dad, I'm an atheist. And he's like, oh, you know, that's kind of awesome, so am I. That's how I found out my dad was an atheist. <laughs> Again, we never talked about religion in the home, so he's an atheist. Uh, so he introduced me to uh, a number of podcasts. Um, main, uh, the first one was Reginald Finley, uh, also known as the Infidel Guy. He had a pretty awesome show back then. I don't think he had, uh, it's not on anymore, I don't think. Uh, and then there were a couple of other podcasts, and it helped me, I mean, obviously I came to atheism on my own, but it helped me hear some of the other arguments um, against the Bible, and, or against religion, not, not just Christianity, actually. Um, and it was, it, was, it was awesome. So that's where I was. Um, I'm still hanging out with friends, and I guess when you're first, I, for me, I, and I, I know I've spoken to other new atheists, um, 
But for me, uh, it was a little bit difficult to hang out with um, some of my old friends because little things would irritate the crap out of me. Like, God bless, uh, <laughs> you know, when somebody sneezes. Like, to, to this day, I don't think it warrants a response, a sneeze. I don't understand that. But anyway, uh, but little things like that. Uh, and so I'm like, you know what? I love my friends. I, uh, you know, I still love them. But I want to meet some other like-minded people. And I went online, um, I looked up some groups in the area, um, and I went to a few meetups, and, uh, unlike this one. <laughs> uh, there, I was the only black person in, in the room. It was uh, local bars or whatever that I would meet up, and it was predominantly um, white male. I didn't, every once in a while, it would be a couple of females, um, and I didn't see any Asians or, at all. So it was, it was me and uh, a number of white males and maybe one or two females. And uh, the first time you're like, okay, well, maybe it's just a fluke. But the, by the third and fourth time, I'm like, you know, there's something going on here. You know, I, I shouldn't be the only black person um, in the room or the only minority uh, in the room. And so I um, decided to kind of look into that issue. I go on to um, a number of social sites uh, that being uh, Facebook, uh, MySpace and stuff, and um, looking for other black atheists. And to my surprise, I'm hearing the same story. Hey, they're, going, they're, be, they're members of their uh, respective groups or whatever, they're spread out across the country, but they're also the only atheists um, in their group or usually one of two um, in their, at the actual event. And, um, so I'm like, you know, this is weird. Let me kind of delve into this issue. At this point, um, I'm semi-open. So if I meet anybody new and religion comes up, I'm like, yeah, I'm an atheist. And if they can't accept it, then screw them. Um, but to my friends, uh, I, wasn't, I still wasn't out. I, I, I just wouldn't talk about religion. I wouldn't bring it up or I, I would uh, avoid the topic. The following semester, however, um, I took a course, another uh, course at uh, Brooklyn College, and it was a uh, comparative religion course. Again, great course. Um, I had never been introduced to any of these, uh, to, uh, any comparative religion course, didn't even know it existed. Um, and this moved me from that passive atheist to an activist, because um, I really got to see the type of impact, the social impact that um, religion played on, uh, the type of impact that religion played on society. Um, the course covered uh, traditional African religions and more of the uh, traditional religions of Latin America. Um, and I really got to see um, how these nations or how a number of nations had evolved from these more indigenous rela uh, religions to uh, predominantly Christian nations via conqueror or wars. Um, also, um, the African, so the traditional African one was the one that I, I, I focused on um, in the course. Um, and it, it kind of, I guess toward the middle of the course, sorry, uh, it kind of went, um, it kind of, it covered the tradition, the, um, I'm sorry, Atlantic slave trade. And um, if you look at it, this was an actual very effective and efficient system. But it is very difficult to get a widespread uh, belief to be so well accepted. And the actual, the only vehicle to get this type of thought process accepted is through religion. You can't do it any other way. Humanity doesn't naturally, as a society, we don't naturally want to uh, beat, enslave, uh, kill people just because we're different from them. We don't, I mean, that's just not a natural thing. But to convince one group of people that they are uh, inherently superior to another group of people, and not, and not simply superior, like, oh, I'm superior, I'm just great. No, not only are you superior, but you have to dehumanize somebody that's darker than you. 
in order for you to, in order for the system to, to be as efficient um, as the Atlantic slave trade, you had to use religion. And this was something that really disturbed me. Because when I learned about uh, slavery here in America, it was your slave master, is, uh, the slave master was a Christian and misused the Bible. Now, that's total crap. Um, it, the Bible clearly endorses slavery. It did not, and you know, I usually get the, 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 the um, argument that, no, 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 the Bible is talking about a slave to God. I'm like, no, you didn't fucking read the book. It doesn't say, you know, yes. <laughs> Don't even get me started. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, sorry. Tangent. So I got the cue cards. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it endorses slavery. Um, and the same thing, they, we, we learned that the, the slaves were um, also Christian, and, and they were good Christians, and it was what it was. And what they leave out is the most important information. This system would not work without its heavy dependence on religion. It, we, we completely leave that out. So learning this information, and kind of, even after the course, it wasn't, the course kind of introduced me to it, but I uh, went, uh, a whole lot further and started to do a lot of this research on my own, um, you start to really understand what it is about religion. Religion requires people to not think. It requires you to, it, to be a good uh, Christian. Now, there are plenty of progressive Christians. I'm not taking that away. Um, but to be your more fundamental Christians, um, you have to not think. You have to say, you have to turn that off. When someone, you know, that, that's what is practiced. That's what is preached. Do not question God. God, you know, is the way. You don't, don't, you know, don't, don't, uh, you know, you evil atheist, as I'm, I'm sometimes called. Um, you don't know what you're talking about. You have to first accept God into your heart. So religion fundamentally requires you to turn off that critical thinking um, skill. I also um, came to the realization as I started to look around that your poorest people and your least educated people tend to A, be the most religious, and uh, B, tend to, be in, it tend to be the most miseducated. And that's what I was able, and that's how I was able to, to link the two. Because before, I didn't really understand the link. Religion endorses miseducation. It, it requires you to simply, again, accept uh, anything that is said to you and to fail to question it. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to focus on um, by starting my organization uh, was improving that, improving critical thinking in poorer areas. That is something that is left out um, of many of our uh, textbooks, of uh, many of our, our programs. Uh, and I think that's actually not simply uh, in you know, poorer communities or in black communities. Uh, it is, in my opinion, it is the American education system, period. Um, we tell kids to read and regurgitate what it is. You know, the better that you're able to regurgitate this information, the better your grades are gonna be. We don't sit down and say, um, no, this is, um, this is how you think. That was the difference in my college. That was, that was way too, I, sorry, that was way too late for me to uh, develop my critical thinking skills. I should not have been in my third year of college learning how to critically think. That was absolutely absurd. I should have had these critical thinking skills better established in my public school education and then later private school education. Um, <clears throat> Um, I should have had it much earlier because it, it makes things so much easier. It, the education system, period, is so much easier when you already have uh, your critical thinking skills well established. So that's one of the um, reasons why I started my organization. Um, and second, um, I also started my organization because I believe, again, a caste system um, can't work without uh, religion either, it, or it can't work. It's not. It's not religion just because it's religion. It's the type of thinking required for religion. So I, it doesn't matter um, to me that it's I, it right now is under the mask of religion, but it's the same line of thinking that supports um, any type of ism in this uh, country or in any country. 
It's the same thing that supports racism. It's the same thing that supports sexism. And so what I want to do is to, again, establish critical thinking skills so that we can get rid of this caste system. There are plenty, and, and everybody's a victim of it. Yes, if you're, if you're the most privileged in this country, you're still a victim of it if you're still believing that blacks are inherently inferior. If you believe that women are inherently inferior, you're still not relying on any type of, there's plenty of information to the contrary, you're not relying on any type of information. You're simply accepting uh, this information that's given to you as fact without questioning it, without questioning it. You're not, oh, thank you. Church <laughs> dog. So uh, again, yeah, establishing critical thinking is uh, key. The second thing that I want to, or actually, let me finish that. Um, yeah, the sec, the the uh, another obstacle, um, or another thing I want to point out is that society will never be at its best in a caste system. Again, your most privileged people are going to benefit from this system, but society as a whole, they would benefit more if, if society as a whole was better. So when you, the, the problem with the caste system, or the problem with, uh, and I, I use caste system because I want to include all isms, uh, but let's talk about racism for a second. The problem with racism is that you have a, a number of people. Uh, I'm not that smart, you know, I, I, and I don't mean that, it's not, I don't mean that in a bad way. What I mean is, I don't, I, when I was in, in, in public school or whatever, um, I was a, a, an AB student, right? So, okay, there were plenty of other AB students that were not able to get to where I am. And a, a lot of it had to do with they didn't have the necessary tools to get to where I am. It's one thing if, you know, and the last statistic I read also was 3% of blacks hold doctorates. It's one thing if um, you're giving, if you decide. I have plenty of friends that decide they don't want to have the, the same level of education. That's great, they have great careers or what have you. But it's a completely different thing if you cripple that kid before they even make the before they even have the opportunity to make that choice. We had an entire group of society, 13 to 15 percent of this society is classified as black, that aren't given the proper uh, tools to make it in this society. We're leaving scientists behind, we're leaving architects behind, we're leaving attorneys, engineers, we're leaving these kids behind. And so in this system, we, we are never going to be at our best when we continue to neglect certain members of society. The second issue that I wanted to address is the type of education that we receive. I, again, I had a, a, a great school. Uh, my, my public high school, but one of the things that um, disturbed me um, throughout my education was the fact that when I looked at history, I saw a lot of white males. Um, for some reason, our textbooks like to leave out women. They like to leave out Asian Americans who have made contributions. They like to leave out blacks that have made contributions. And so when we're learning about those who have made contra major contributions, we only learn ab about this narrow lens, Eurocentric uh, type of person who was able to make these contributions. I am not taking away from the contributions from these individuals. I'm saying that our educational system needs to be more representative of the type of people, of, of our society. It's not only one type of person. We need to um, educate our children so that they can sit down and say, hey, that person looks like me. Uh, it was a long time before I was able to see people on television that looked like me. President Obama has done um, his presence alone, whether you agree with his politics or not is irrelevant. His, po his presence alone has done wonders. That we are finally starting to see intellectual blacks on, on, uh, on popular television show, or popular, I'm sorry, uh, stations on, as newscasters. Um, this was something that I didn't necessarily see when I was growing up. I didn't see a lot of these people. Now, I, was, I, I consider myself very fortunate. Uh, I had an education also at home. I had resources at home where my parents uh, had uh, certain books and uh, certain reading material, which I don't know if it's me or. You need to hold it up in your mind. It's going in and out. Um, oh, is it? I don't know. See, I'm not techie. Uh, <laughs> So um, I had books at home, and so when I, w I was able to point to people that uh, throughout history that were able to um, 
that were a, that would could be inspired by. I'm not saying I can only be inspired by blacks, but it does something horrible to a child's psyche when they only see somebody that does not look like them that's being taught that that they're being taught is our um, major con contri contributors, sorry, uh, to society. And so my goal is also to um, get this type of education into uh, our our public school system. Um, so, uh, with BAM again, sorry. I want to um, also uh, focus on having uh, atheists meet. It's one, this is why we're all here today. It's one thing to have a group of atheists that are you know, colleagues or friends online, and it's great. You get to have debates and conversations or what have you, uh, but it's a complete, we are social beings. It's a completely different thing when you're able to um, actually meet a real life person. I understand the internet is great, but it still doesn't take away from that fundamental social aspect of meeting actual people. And so part of my organization seeks to do that as well, create an actual community within the black community um, or in underrepresented communities, um, you know, a real life uh, place where uh, like-minded people can meet. So where we are today, with uh, Black Atheists in America, we currently have two programs that we are working on. The first one, again, critical thinking, I can't say it enough, um, with young kids. It's called the After School Cubed program. Um, and basically what we want to do is to have an, a, a normal after school program. We're going to have these programs in poorer areas. Uh, which again tend to be heavily populated with um, blacks um, and what we want to do is to help kids obviously with their homework like a normal after-school program have some uh, parents have some place where to put their kids I actually have a side note about that have a, have, uh, a place where parents can put their kids and then um, uh, work on their critical thinking skills because at home there's going to be um, a lot of work done to cripple these skills. My goal, oddly enough, is not to make people atheists. That is ridiculous. What I want to do is to improve education and have them come to their uh, decision on their own. I expect it to be that, but it may or may not. At minimum, I want, uh, you know, if it's going to be a, a theist, I want it to be like a Newton type theist. Like, I want it to be somebody that doesn't apply that poor critical, that, that lack of critical thinking to every other aspect of their lives. Um, the importance of this critical, I'm sorry, the importance of this program, uh, this is a side note that I just uh, remembered, um, is because poorer families tend not to have a lot of money, obviously, by definition. Um, and oftentimes you have these single parent households where kids, where parents don't have uh, the resources necessarily uh, to put their kid in acceptable places. And so there was a recent case study, um, oh, well, it, it was a recent case, not study, I'm sorry, um, where there was a, a, a guy in Mississippi and he um, had this uh, shitty ass place where poor parents were dropping their kids off at. They didn't have any other options. Um, I'm assuming part of it was distance and uh, the other was money. Uh, I'm not really sure, but I, I know money was one of the, the issues. So he was preying on poor kids and obviously, um, if not all black, definitely a majority, a vast majority of the kids were black. And so he had asbestos, he had issues where um, he didn't follow the, the guidelines um, that are in place to protect our children. We only have, I don't know what the actual ratio is, so I apologize, but you have one adult per X amount of kids under a certain age, and that is put into place so that you can make sure that there is adequate supervision of children. He got cited. Instead of sitting here and uh, saying, you know what, maybe my place is a little crappy, he decided to turn his organization to a 501c3. Not the type of 501c3 that, I, that I'm working on, but no, no. The, a 501c3 under a religious entity. Every, all of that is wiped out once you do that. It's, it, because they no longer have, you know, you can uh, do it under the guise of religion. You no longer have the type of audits that other organizations have. This is horrible. We should not be allowing um, our kids to be subject to these uh, 
conditions. The reason why these child, why these laws are in place is to protect our children. So that's one of the things. I want a safe place for children to be able to go in these neighborhoods and where they're not going to be indoctrinated with religion. And so that's one of the reasons why I want to, to um, implement that program. Uh, the second program is called our Science Cubed program. We're uh, much further with that. Actually, we're going to start in, in, uh, in the fall uh, with this program. We have a number of teachers who are already on, um, on our, uh, already we're working with. Um, this program is a program where we take donations, we buy supplies, and we give the supplies directly to high school uh, teachers in poorer areas. And the reason for this is uh, to, again, improve critical thinking. And what better way to do that than to better science programs across the nation? Now, we have, um, there was a recent study that was done by Adopt a Classroom. And the average uh, teacher spends apparently $1,200 a year out of her, his or her pocket in order to fund, um, in order to provide supplies for their, their kids. This is absolutely crazy. Teachers don't make money. I mean, what is it, like forty to $50,000 a year or something like that? I mean, to have to spend $1,200 a year just to do your job is, is ridiculous. And I, I can imagine that it's worse in poorer areas. I've um, read a number of case studies. I've gone to a number of schools. I have fr uh, that friend, I have family members that um, are in some of the New York City uh, school systems around here. Um, and there are reports from uh, some of my family members that they don't have running water in their um, science labs, that they're not doing labs, they're doing simulation. I, it's my opinion, but I don't believe that's how you learn. I believe that you actually have to, I can't imagine having taken chemistry and writing it down on a piece of paper, well, this is what should happen. No, the kids need to be able to do the actual study. And so what I'm saying is that we need to be able to provide the supply, or what we want to do is to provide the supplies to the, um, to the uh, actual teacher in an effort to uh, help them better educate their children. Um, this is not a process where we just go in and we get a, a shopping list from a teacher. This is actually a pretty intricate process and that's why we started so early. We meet with, we sit down with the teacher, we ask them for the supplies, so that's where the, 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 the list comes in, the shopping list. But we also ask them um, what it is that they want to achieve with these products. What is it that um, they are, um, how do they think that this will better their program and how do they think that this will better the critical thinking skills of their students. And so we've gotten, um, we started the program in LA, uh, California. Uh, we got a number of teachers and most of them were like books and you know, normal things like that, basic supplies. But I want to, just a side note, I have a one teacher who uh, was like, yeah, can I get some dead fish? <laughs> and I was like, okay. Um, so I'm, I'm happy because I want this program to be something that is um, run by the teacher. The teacher that asked me for the dead fish is actually a marine biologist, uh, high school uh, teacher. Uh, I think most of her students are black and Hispanic. She has about 160 students. And right now, she is, they, she, they do labs. Um, but she, again, comes out of pocket. She goes to the fish market uh, to get live fish. She goes, uh, she comes out of pocket to uh, give her kids, uh, you know, something to, to look at, you know, to compare the fish or something like that. Um, and so what we're going to do next year is to actually give her the dissection tools so that they can do the actual labs. Uh, and she's very excited about that. And, and we're very excited to work with her and the other uh, teachers in the area. So um, that's all I have. Thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Thank you. Do you run into any legalities in going directly to a teacher rather than through a school system or through the principal? Absolutely. It started in New York because we had so much red tape and I had to like get on an agenda or something with a PTA meeting. I didn't know if it was because my organization has the word atheist in it and it's not that friendly, um, or if it was the actual red tape. In California, the, the teachers were like, no, you can come here. I, I, there's a retired lady out there, a retired teacher out there who actually put me in contact with a number of the teachers. And I'm also working, I'm not working with Adopt a Classroom, but some, that's where I got the teachers from, that organization. So, no, not here in New, um, not in California, here in New York, yes. I think uh, what you're doing is fabulous. Thank you. Uh, 
I'm a teacher, so I also like your uh, focus on critical thinking. And I just have, I guess, one suggestion to make. Um, you talk about religion as being necessary for racism, uh, I'm sorry, for, for um, slavery. And I think there have been many, many instances in history, going back many thousands of years, where you have slavery that's not reinforced by religion. Where you have one country, the Phoenicians, the Egyptians, uh, the Hebrews, the Romans, the Greeks, who conquer some other people and enslave them, and it has absolutely nothing to do with religion. <laughs> I guess I was, uh, maybe I didn't make that clear. Um, I was speaking specifically about the Atlantic slave trade and why and why it was so successful on such a wide scale because of it relying on that um, lack of critical thinking, which I think that I'm not sure if you uh, still disagree. I'm curious as to how you grew your organization. Did you start off with a website, and if so, how did you attract the eyeballs to the website, or if it was networking, how did you do the original network? Uh, I started on social sites, actually, um, and when I started the organization, I to post my website on these on these uh, social sites. So on Facebook, there's a black atheist group already established. It was uh, maybe uh, 100 or something, and now it's like 300. Uh, people, word of mouth, um, that's, you know, that's how, I, I, marketing, I, ha I had a marketing consultant uh, that moved my web page from page seven to page one, number one now, yes, holla. Uh, yeah. Huh? Uh, Twitter. So yeah, social sites is how I, I grew it. Can I just, sure. I just want to adjust the comment about the uh, about the slave trade mm -hmm. under the endorsement of religion. Uh, I'm sure that's absolutely true about you know the, the Phoenicians and earlier. Uh, but as you say, the, the, the dealing with the colonies. Um, I happen to be reading uh, People's History of the United States by Howard Finn. And, uh, I'm sorry, I'm Howard Zinn, that's right. And um, it deals with the fact that, uh, for instance, the Church of Rome, uh, that I think one of the legates from Portugal actually wrote a letter to the Pope um, asking if the slave trade as it was being conducted was legal under church law, and he was assured that it in fact was. Um, and I know that uh, in the South, uh, they were very uh, long, treat long, and uh, in some cases even brilliant treatises written in defense of slavery. Uh, some of the plantations, not all the slaves were beaten, but it was a, it was still a very destructive, horrible situation, and it was justified by people who thought that they were actually doing dark people a favor by being custodial. So. I think there's ample evidence to suggest that, um, that the slave trade in the United States and you know, wherever had, had been, was done under the aegis of some kind of religious support. For those who do have a Bible, you'll find not only in the Old Testament Deuteronomy and the Deuteronomy and Leviticus, but you will also find in the New Testament <clears throat> under Luke 12. 47 and 48, you remember that. Luke 12, 47, 48. Information that slavery, that, guess who said this? Jesus Christ said it's okay to beat your slaves. There's so many stripes, etc., etc. And that was a justification for slavery and beating slaves in the South. As oh, I see now, now we get it directly up there. And beating slaves in the South, but also uh, a, a justification for the Civil War with the Bible Belt area defending the book, the Holy Book. So things like that is where you get this information and where they believe that it's okay to do that. And that's why the slave masters did it with diligence, but did it with their heart, because they thought it was okay, the Bible said so. I really enjoyed your talk, too. Um, I'm a, I'm a uh, first grade public school teacher here in New York, and I teach in 99% uh, uh, you know, lower economic, uh, lower economic and uh, black and Hispanic neighborhood. Um, black and Hispanic school, and I was just wondering. I mean, on a on a in my class, I really do try and bring out critical thinking skills on in a way that they can understand even things like, did you like that book and why or why not that type of thing in a way that they can understand. But do you feel that there's anything else that I can do, um, or I even tell them like, if you disagree with me, let me know. You know, I'm not going to get angry. Just explain why. 
is it, do you feel like there's anything else I can do as a teacher in my class um, that can promote those types of critical thinking skills without uh, losing my job, <laughs> um, insulting their family's beliefs, and in a way that they, the little ones can understand? Um, yeah. Um... Well, okay, I'm not a teacher, so um, I don't know. But um, explaining, I mean, you don't have to use the word claim. You don't have to use religion, so I don't know why I would even bring up. But yeah, explaining what evidence is um, on their level. You know, I, I don't know how to teach first graders. Um, explaining what a claim is, um, but just getting them to really understand, oh yeah, well there's evidence for this, or there's evidence for that. One of the things, um, I, I, one of the ladies that's actually um, helping me, uh, don't kill me, but she's actually a theist, but she's a damn good uh, teacher. Uh, she um, is a third grade teacher, and one of the things that she was telling me that she wanted to bring in were magic tricks, and to show them, oh look, it's magic, um, except for, now I'm gonna show you how to do the trick. And that was one of the things that she said is, is, is amazing in, in helping to develop critical thinking skills. Uh, maybe there are books on it, I don't know, but um, that's, that's why I don't wanna be the actual teacher. I, I, I wanna bring in teachers to do the work uh, for me, or with me, sorry. Thank you. you realize there's a consultant fee that you would go on charging <laughs> I just want to say, girl, I'm grateful and thankful for you. <laughs> Thank you. It's so nice to see what you're doing. I, I really am grateful. I, I can't say that I prayed for you, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, some of the things you talked about brought back a little bit of, of what I went through. I, um, over 80 years ago, I asked my grandmother who raised me, probably about eight or nine, uh, Mama, who wrote the Bible? And the answer was like, uh, some holy man wrote the Bible and you have to have faith. That was it. I went on to become a school, uh, a uh, Sunday school teacher. But uh, I always had that dial, you know? And uh, a few years ago, I started really telling myself, not in other people, you know you're an atheist. <laughs> and uh, just a few years ago, I started also telling a few people in the family and my uh, world that I was. And I get very bad uh, vibes from them. I, my question to you is, these people that uh, know me and love me and know that I'm an atheist feel it's their duty to every time almost they have something to say that's important to bring up God, knowing, you know, that how I feel about it. I usually don't answer, but I'm getting to the point now that I feel I should start trying to answer. And uh, I wondered if you had it. I come from the Lord uh, group, you know, economic group, and those are the people that I'm with. So I would like to know if you have any kind of, uh, any thoughts on just how I should answer. Uh, that's a tough one. Um, I have, uh, actually there's a recent uh, thread on, on Facebook about this. Um, it's the same thing, like religion was never an issue until I became an open atheist with my friends. It was never talked about, you know, like I said, very few, every once in a while it would be, oh, God bless you or something like that, but it was never talked about. And now it's like every single conversation is, oh, I'm going to pray for Ayana or, you know, I'm going to, because they love me and they don't want to see me in hell. And I'm like, well, God, whatever. Um, <laughs> I would, I mean, I wouldn't obviously, I mean, the, I try to come at people, uh, depending on the personality, but for the most part, uh, especially with friends, from a perspective, to, to try to understand, I guess, where they're coming from, uh, because I, I was there, um, and I know for some people they like to be that, you know, super aggressive atheist, and I would love to at times, especially, you know, my legal background, that's what I'm used to, um, but I guess, coming from a, a, I guess a softer side if there's a such thing, or coming from, you know, asking, maybe using the Socratic method as opposed to making arguments against them. Asking them, you know, well, why is it that you believe that? Or why is it that, you know, you know who wrote the Bible? Well, how do you know they didn't get it wrong and stuff? That's kind of the approach that I take with, with friends. It's not the same approach I take with, like, you know, if I was out with some person that just wanted to tell me how they feel. Like, I'm, I'm totally combative. But with friends, 
yeah, that, that I take more of a Socratic approach and approach. Sorry, and I usually don't make um, arguments uh, to support. Most atheists that I've ever been confronted with or know, know aren't really that interested in making other people atheists. Yeah. It's usually almost always from the other side mm -hmm. that, uh, and, and, and when uh, people have said they'll pray for me, I will sometimes say, well, how are those prayers for peace coming? How are those working out? Um. I actually tell them that I'll pray to Satan for them because it's the same thing. I'm like, I told you, I, I, I very much am opposed to your Abrahamic God, he's an ass, and you still say, well, you know, I'm, I'm still gonna pray for you. And I'm like, well, okay, if you don't, I was like, you know, I make sure that they don't like Satan. There's a Satanist church I, I heard around in the village that's a, a theist Satanist church, not like some atheist making fun of uh, theists. And so I, was, I, I always tell them I'm gonna to go to the church and pray for them as well. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. Um, I'm from the Caribbean myself, and uh, we've talked a little bit about having many of the same issues that I think blacks face here in the United States. I just wonder, in terms of critical thinking, I've had a, a number of discussions with people even back in Barbados and other Caribbean countries, and they're, yes, yes, the critical thinking, we need to think more, we need to be able to discuss things and to, to understand evidence and reasoning. But when it comes to the no God thing, it's like they just back away. It's just, they're just not going there at all. It's like regulative, as they would say. I just wonder, in your experience, how has bringing this message under the banner of atheism been accepted by the teachers particularly? I mean, even though they may with the ideals that you're promoting, has the fact that it has come from an organization that has atheism been in any way a barrier or has it been something that they just say, this is what we want to do and it doesn't matter what you're coming with, we will respond. I, I'm just interested in your experiences because it could, could help us. I just moved to California to, to do the, that pro, the Science Cube program. But the great thing about science, my, the, the program is the fact that it's science teachers. So either they're hardly religious for the most part. I mean, these are not like creationist crazy people. Uh, but they are um, teachers that understand the scientific method. Like that's something I make sure of before I even uh, consider uh, donating supplies. I haven't really faced any resistance. They have, they don't even say anything about the name at all. They're like, oh, thank you so much. Um, I'm guessing part of it is they're tired of spending all this money on supplies. And I, I mean, basically all I'm doing is saying, hey, I, I wanna help you out. Here are some supplies to help you out. And in LA, I haven't faced any resistance um, at all. They have, they have said nothing about the organization's name or anything. Problems dealing in the rural areas where you have school boards that consists of people that are very religious, and they have to deal with them. You remember Dover, Pennsylvania? Oh, yes. All right. So those type of areas, you have to deal with them, and they are, <clears throat> I don't want to say little, but intimidated quite a bit when they want to come up there and teach something that is established as evolution. As established as evolution, they have problems doing that. And if you mention an age of something that's going back like this earth, 4.56 billion years old, they look at you like you're crazy. No, it's only 6,000 years old. In fact, in Kentucky, you have a museum over there that happens to have an anatomical figure, it's called the Creation Museum, by the way, of a T-Rex that's munching on grass. We don't have molars, and they don't have molars. They have inside, we have molars, but they have incisors, six-inch ones, flesh eaters. These are carnivorous. And there's a little girl right down next to this T-Rex that happens to be picking up giant eggs. And we weren't around at the same time they were around. That's 65 million years ago. But here's the problem. These students believe that, and their parents believe that, and the school board believes it, and that gives a lot of teachers a very difficult barrier to which to overcome and say, well, you should understand an alternative point of view. That's what they have to say now. And that's unfortunate because it isn't an alternative point of view, and this is what they want to get there. And, and, and teach inside of a, a science class where there's flying dragons and talking snakes in a real science class. Would you imagine that? But this is what they have to confront. These are the barriers. These are the seemingly imponderables that they have to deal with because they're not getting the help they need from those school boys. The situation over here in, in, in New York City is not easy to deal with, but you don't have that type of school board problem, generally speaking. You may have a community problem as far as a district 
office is concerned, but you've got to be able to get that effort. In other words, go there and find out what are your limitations. How far can you teach? Can you discuss this in detail? Can you discuss that? Science is not to be put on the same level as, cre as creation, uh, uh, intelligent design. This is an established theory, theory based, and they mentioned there's two names. And I always tell the science teachers, mention it. In the, in the um, Oxford Dictionary, there are two definitions for theory. One theory is a colloquial term, which is used basically for individuals who are speaking on a common term, what we would normally call in science, a hypothesis, guesswork. But there's the other one that's the established theory based on facts. Just as there is a theory of relativity, the theory of gravity, et cetera, et cetera, these are proven scientific facts established that's falsifiable, provable, testable, and predictable. And when you have a religious dogma, you don't get that. You just accept it as what was told to you, and you can't even verify or do anything else like that. And that's where the problem is. It cannot be on the level of science. Science teachers, you have to get out there and you have to mention that and find out limitations where you're going to go and go and dig in because here's what it is. We used to be number one in science and mathematics, and now we're something like number 24 in math and about, what, 17 in science? That's a darn shame. You have China that's now number one in both science and mathematics. Where do you think they can go way ahead of us with weapons technology, hydrogen bombs, anything else? And where does that put us? You folks are patriots. As much as they want to think that we're some communists because of the uh, uh, of Russian when they have uh, no religion or anything like that, you're more patriotic than others because you realize the importance of the education and a scientific education. We need that. And for you to get out there and stand upon that, you're doing a very good job. Thank you. I have a question that goes off in a different direction, and I'm not even sure how to phrase it. Given the historic importance within the black community of the churches, particularly the civil rights movement, everybody who let it had the name Reverend in front of them. That's if, not true. Well, an overstatement, but you know what? Yeah. If you want me to go down the list, I'd be yeah, happy well, to. Go ahead, ask me. Well, and I wouldn't interrupt your question either. Sorry. Um, if you are successful, what do you think might be the political and social consequences for it? You know, e even today, the black churches are very powerful politically. If you're successful, what happens? Uh, a much better society? Uh, I mean, um, if I, okay, I, let me just define success. Success is not having those churches. You know, one of the things my mother used to say to me, uh, if you want to know what's destroying a community, find out what's in the poor community and you'll see a ton of it in the poor community. Liquor stores and churches are on every single block in the black community. Yes. And so, if I'm successful, then they'll have to have the same, they'll have to meet the same requirements that I have to meet as a 501c3. If I'm successful, then they won't have a congregation. If I'm successful, we'll be much more uh, further advanced than we are today because we'll no longer be uh, uh, supporting racism. We'll no longer be supporting um, a, uh, this lack of critical thinking, endorsing it, holding it up. How many times have we heard in the news, oh my God, he was so nice, he went to church all the time. <laughs> we're, you know, we're, we're saying these are wonderful things. No, going to church is not a wonderful thing. We, to, if I'm successful, we'll truly examine uh, what it is that uh, these, these churches were. And you spoke about the Civil Rights Movement. Um, the problem is that people uh, attribute religion to why we overcame that. No, we overcame that. We overcame slavery. We overcame these issues in the, in the, uh, during civil rights, not because of religion, but because people were tired of living the way that they were living. That happens regardless. Nobody likes to live as, as second and third class citizens anywhere. Nobody likes you know to, to, to put into a society and not get anything back. And so explaining this to people that it was simply a building, a place for people to congregate, uh, if I'm successful, then they'll understand that religion was, was just something that was there that was unnecessary. You know, people have a tendency to go in church, and I'm familiar with what she's saying, familiar with it. They're going to go and say, well, you know what, uh, what are you going to do? How, look at our plans that we have, the problems that are existing over there. They'll say to themselves, you know, I'm going to wait for God to give me the, the courage and the worry to go and speak to them. Wait for that. You want to be doing critical thinking on your own and make the impetus to go and do that. That's where the problem comes in with the church. At least that's one of the problems that they will depend on that, or they'll say, I'll just let, let, put it in God's hand. Make the critical thinking, come to a solution, go ahead and do it. This is what is needed more as far as that is concerned. And that's where the community is lacking that, at least some of the things that they're lacking. The church has a lot of good things about it. 
and then it gets the community together and it helps them uh, with family problems and other things like that, but you don't want to be dependent as far as critical thinking is concerned, and this is where she's saying you've got to get them to think on their own and say, well, since we got that battle that occurred in New Orleans or wherever the case may be, or Selma walking there, we have to start thinking of plans to do things and don't wait for just the preacher to say do it, but think in the community and think ahead and use critical thinking for that. That's where the key is. Uh, and just a, another note on that, Number, uh, Martin Luther King actually spoke out a lot against black churches, yet he has Reverend in front of his name. Um, he spoke out because of that they weren't, uh, many of them were not active. Again, they don't have to do anything but promote their own agenda. And so uh, Martin Luther King spoke out about it. We, again, when we talk about people like W.E.B. Du Bois, we leave out the fact that, they, that, you know, that he wasn't uh, really religious. When we talk about Langston Hughes, we don't talk about how he was a free thinker. Yes, still a believer, but a free thinker. And he constantly questioned, why is it that my people live in squalor um, and, and you know, they're good Christians? Same thing with Frederick Douglass. These are things that we are not taught about in our history books, if we're lucky enough to even see them in our history books. And that's one of the things that you know will, will continue um, unless we change the, the educational system here in uh, America. I'd just like to follow up on what that lady said um, about how you actually you know, talk to someone. One of the most insidious and you know, things that we see in you know the African American community today is the growth of this so-called success gospel. Um, where these preachers tell you know poor people that if you give them a hundred dollars a month, you know, you will wealth and success will follow. Uh, I think and people can get trapped by that and people are being trapped by that. It's just amazing the number of you know people who hand out so and if you do know somebody like that is giving hundreds of dollars to you know, you just say to them, look, why don't you stop giving hundreds of dollars to, you know, this guy. He's got enough money already. You know, I think this guy, Creflo Dollar, has a private jet or something that he flies around in. And just, you know, save a couple of hundred bucks and, you know, go to college. Take a credit, you know, take, take a credit instead of, you know, praying. Why didn't he? Frederick Douglass said, you know, I, I prayed and prayed and prayed for freedom, but I didn't get my freedom until I got off. And, you know... And, and ran, you know, and, you know, get up off my knees, and that's what people have to do. So, thanks again. Um, are you going to give Ken the websites and everything like that? The, the links? Okay, thanks. Have you got black atheists of America that work? I, I also want to say that um, this is another thing that I, I speak out against recently, we were lobbying in uh, DC, is uh, again with the churches, you know. Uh, what is his name? Um, the one with the sex scandal recently. Eddie Long. Eddie Long settled for $2 million with those boys. Where the hell did he get $2 million from? 15. No. 15? 15 million. Five, sorry. I thought it was $2 million. Sorry, 15. wrong information. Steve, skeptics. Uh, $15 million. Um, and where the hell did he get the money from? He got the money from, from the black community. Can you imagine if we put that type of money into our educational system? It, we, we would see wonders. Um, a lot of people don't look at churches as taking from the community, but they take from the community. They take, 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 and they are not required to put anything back in. And that is something that we need to really uh, look at. When they have tax exempt status, we're sitting here, uh, people are often like, no, it's, it's, it's this, it's the, uh, the, you know, the liquor stores. I'm not for liquor stores on every corner, but at the end of the day, they pay freaking taxes. They fund your schools. Churches aren't doing this. And we really need to hold them up to the same exact standard as other 501 c 3s We need to audit them. We need to stop letting them get a free pass just because they put the word God somewhere. So that's it. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Can I just say something? And all they need, by the way, are just two or three Sundays in those 50, I'm sorry, 20,000 member churches, those mega churches, a couple of Sundays they'll get their money back, the 15 million that he gave out. That shows you the potential that, that can happen in those churches. Oh, I just saw on the web <coughs> yesterday that um, Eddie Long is expanding his church and is still asking for a thousand dollar donation per family to keep his, to get, you know, for this church to get into the stand. Unbelievable. And he's going to get it. Yep. Yep. Oh, and last thing on that, um, my grandmother is 91 years old, uh, and she cuts up her pay her pension check in thirds. One third goes to the church. Yes. The other two thirds go to uh, 
something else. I don't know. So yeah, I, I do know somebody like that. I, you know, you can't. I, she's 91. <laughs> I can't convince her otherwise. She's had a lot of uh, indoctrination. So it's it happens, it's and it's rough. unfortunate. Yeah. You mentioned that it was important to you not um, that it was important to you not to just have a face or, or uh, internet presence, but actual a physical location, so to create community. So I was just wondering what you actually do at your meetings to create community. Because if I look at, at my experience, just say just coming to the New York City Atheists, I found that if I come, say, just to the brunch once a month, every time I come, I've been sitting at a table with different people. That's not exactly a community. You know, so it's just, and, and so of course what the churches do provide for people, if nothing else, is a community. They show up every Sunday, you know, you're sitting next to the same people week after week after week. You get to know the people, you know, get to know what's going on in their lives. So I was wondering, what are you doing to create that in your organization? Uh, well, there are two things. Um, first, uh, same or similar. Having speakers, we had an event in New York City where we had three, well, myself and two other speakers, uh, the other two directors. Um, so that's one. A lot of people, I mean, you can use the internet to butt dress that. You can use the internet to, to learn about people, whatever. Like, I've met people online and then I see them in person and sometimes I forget that I didn't meet them before. Again, I mean, it, it doesn't, I guess that contradicts my previous statement, but it doesn't necessarily prevent, I mean, it doesn't necessarily um, stop uh, people from from necessarily uh, coming together uh, at a an actual location. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. Uh, you can use the, but the internet can definitely be used to learn about people. So when you come to this event, uh, these type of events, you, you're not necessarily sitting at a table with complete strangers. You could be sitting at a table with people that you've communicated with for uh, um, some time or online. Okay, just want to mention something. By the way. Besides the internet, you do have a lot of television programs like Positively Black, a number, a plethora of different radio shows that blacks listen to very carefully. And listen, all you have to do is try, and this is what we're going to be trying to do, and we'll be working with her, to get the people involved, to get interviews, to get onto those shows, to meet, meet those organizations. When you're on those radio shows, you're giving another point of view, an alternative point of view as to the reasons why. That's what needs to get out there. Spend, send that spark out there, and things will be able to go and multiply. It can be done. We're going to do it. And a sec. Oh, sorry. I was going to say the second thing that I wanted to do is to actually get out. I don't want to like. I, I, I appreciate speaker events. Uh, I'm glad to be here, but I also want to get out in the community and do so that this. And I think that when you do philanthropic events, it, it starts to at minimum take away that stigma of, of the word atheist. Good. It's interesting that Rod just mentioned uh, the radio programs because I was going to ask you if you are in a position to influence the media at all. One of the most famous media personalities whose shows I always enjoy, who is absolutely brilliant in his interviewing skills, and I'm sure I don't have to mention his name, when I uh, tell you that he concludes every broadcast with Keep the Faith, uh, which aggravates me after I've heard a wonderful program, uh, that, that aggravates me uh, considerably. And then everybody who comes on his show, he says, thank you brother, thank you sister, as though he's uh, conducting a, um, a sermon. And I, he's absolutely brilliant, and I love the shows. And I was wondering if your organization is in a position to influence any of these um, uh, radio and TV programs and tell them that they're, you know, that this is somewhat out of place. In my opinion. Um, Very good. She talked about Tab Smiley. Uh, yeah, I, I figured. Uh, oh yeah. Um, well, thus far, um, as Rad just said, um, I I have been out there. I've been working. One of the first people. I, I got very very lucky. I didn't expect my company to grow uh, as fast as it did. Uh, one of the first people I met was Richard Dawkins. So yeah, I I, I think that I'm I'm able to get out there. Um, I also, I had a recent interview with Freedom From Religion Foundation. Um, what are the people I want, I'm trying to, I haven't gotten any, anywhere with it. I want to set up a, uh, a, a discussion between uh, Dr. West 
um, and an atheist because I, I think Dr. West, outside of his religion, is actually a, a brilliant. But um, when it comes to, uh, but he always has to put God somewhere. But as far as social issues, I, I think he's brilliant. And there are a couple of atheists. I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Anthony Penn or uh, Dr. Sakibu Hutchinson or uh, any of these people. But there, there are a number. We're getting out there. So yeah, I, I think we will definitely have uh, the, the necessary influence to to make change. Thank you. Good to know why you've been communicating on Facebook a lot. Yes. Um, I just have a question because we have somewhat of a familiar background. Uh, I have a couple of cousins in my immediate family that are very educated, uh, have advanced degrees, law degrees, master's degrees. How is it that you're able to obtain that level of education but suspend critical thinking when it's time to think about your religion? Because the two individuals I'm addressing are actually uh, ordained ministers now, and it really surprises me. I just can't figure out how they're able to obtain law degrees, master's degrees, and then when it comes to something simple like this, they're just able to just totally just forget everything. Um, I, uh, to answer your question, when, when I was in law school, I was the only black atheist. My best friend from law school uh, is a deist or something. She doesn't go to church or anything uh, and hardly ever prays. But the, everybody was, was a theist. Or some, all the black kids, I'm sorry, were, were theists. So there's about 14 of us in law school. So um, that's exactly what you what you said. They separate. They uh, compartmentalize it. Uh, they don't apply when because evidence is a class required in law school. You cannot get through law school without taking evidence. And evidence says you know you need X, Y, and Z in order to uh, make your. You're not going to get away with God in court. Let's, I'll just sum it up like that. Um, and so these people. My best friend did way better than me actually. In in uh, I think she got an A in, in evidence, but. She suspends it when it comes to, to the God. Well, or she's a bad example because she says she just wants to believe that there's something bigger and better. But for the rest of them, that they just suspend it when it comes to everything else. So you can get through law school if you're going to turn it off. I just want to mention something very quick to you because the time is short. You know, this not only occurs in the black community, but in the white community yeah. as well. Yeah. The Crystal Palace, you know that, that big church out in California, that preacher called a Smiley has a son who's not, doesn't Wasn't want to be what he is. Shula. Shula, Shula, that's the one. Oh. Let me tell you something, look in the audience. What do you think you see? You see a lot of educated looking people. They're intelligent or not, they're educated looking people, you're sure they're, and they have been on, they're doctors and lawyers. I watched that closely. A lot of people have a very good background, but as you said, mentioned, compartmentalization, this is what occurs. So what you have is they think one thing, and all of a sudden they go back like a robot and start thinking uh, the church and whatnot because of the way they were raised, it's the indoctrination. It's sunk inside. I heard a very good expression years ago, when you walk into a house of worship, you hang up your brains. Yeah. Leave, and, the leave your brains at the door. The last, uh, the, the last point. My mother's a physical therapist, and she's a, a Baptist, and she's been published. Um, she's very smart, but again, she turns it off when it comes to religion. So, the, the church experience growing up in religion is so emotional for black people. It's very, you know, clapping the hands, good time, good mood after, you know. And is there a way that going off what you said about Philip? Uh, like philanthropic events that we can go into places like Harlem and do stuff like clothing drives and do stuff to help out the community, the lower economic people, so that they can see that we're not immoral people, that we have love in our hearts for our community. And also, I feel like a lot of black people just don't know what people like Frederick Douglass said against religion. They don't know that but there were civil rights people like Jay Rogers that, that they either ignore it or they were never taught or they just, they don't know about Butterfly McQueen, the actress from Gone with the Wind, who was, was an atheist, you know, donated money to Freedom from Religion Foundation. We have to start informing them and going into the communities and I feel like the way we can start to do that is doing things out of love and doing things that they can see, helping the kids, helping the poor people and and I'm just wondering, is there like a community service aspect that could possibly form? And I'm so touched by this this lady over here that got up, a former Sunday school teacher. If the elderly black people, for instance, in Harlem could see a woman like this, and you could tell your story about how you used to be a Sunday school teacher, and like what the things that went through your head to like get you to, you know, step away from that. I think that it's all about informing. 
Like, because we just, from the time we're born, God this, God that, thank you, God, for whatever. And it's just such an emotional thing. And so, yeah, I guess my, it was more of a comment, I guess, but is there a way that we as black atheists can get together and, and start impacting the community directly and informing them at the same time as helping them? I don't, I don't want to have, obviously, you're not going to sit at a sermon and be like, oh, this is why. But uh, I definitely want to have literature available because uh, a lot of the kids question, I mean, the same way that, that we did. Uh, philanthropic events, definitely. I've been talking to Ken Bronstein about borrowing blood, their tent. Uh, blood, we give blood donations, too. Oh, okay. So, so they give blood donations. That's shows the community. We're not ghouls with blood, but we want to help you. Um, so... Uh, and I've been talking to him about putting up a tent on 125th Street. So yes, I'm definitely looking forward to doing something in the community. Because that, that's, again, it defeats the purpose if I don't have it in the black community. If we're not present in the black community, uh, it, it completely defeats what I'm trying to achieve. I have a Watson. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.